me all here today. Uh, know that the, the Father is worthy of our praise. If you stand, we will then begin.
Uh, thank you guys, you can have a seat. I want to welcome you to, uh, to Mission Point here this morning. Glad that you are here. If you have your Bible, I want to go ahead and invite you to turn to the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 34 is where we're going to be here this morning. Exodus chapter 34. And uh, again, just uh, if I haven't been able to meet you, it's a, it's a pleasure to be back. I haven't been back since around, uh, I guess, around Labor Day. Uh, that weekend, and so it's good to be back, and, and much like I know uh, Daniel, who has filled in and, and filled the pulpit to preach as well, he's been kind of, when he comes back, he keeps going through Revelation. When I come back, we keep going through the book of Exodus, and so that's where we're going to be here tonight in Exodus, or tonight, that's where we're going to be here this morning, Exodus chapter 34, and if you would, I want to look at verse 27 and 28 to begin with, uh, and then we're going to we're gonna dive in, but Exodus 34 Verse 27, it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Write down these words, for in accordance with these words I have made a covenant with you and with Israel. So Moses was there with the Lord forty days and forty nights. He did not eat bread or drink water, and he wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. Before we go any further, I want you to I want to invite you to pray with me. Father, as we come into your presence here this morning, just as a corporate group, uh, Lord, I pray that uh, with so many different things that are going on in our life um, and just the reality of what this year has been and is continuing to be, Lord, um, I pray that we could have just uh, a, a, a directed focus on you here this morning. And if you would, just in an attitude of prayer where you're sitting or if you're watching online, would you just pray for yourself for just a moment that the Lord would give you uh, an attentive mind um, and, and, and a heart that has an affection for him here this morning. And if you would, would you, would you pray for me that I would be a of help to you this morning, and that ultimately uh, our time would be honoring and glorifying to Him. Well, Father, this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So, the last time that I was with you, that Labor Day weekend, the, the very next day, Tiffany and I had the opportunity to be able to go out of town. We were able to go uh, to Navarre Beach, and we were able to enjoy a uh, a vacation. It was it was our second vacation in two years in a row. That hadn't happened in like nine years. Like we hadn't gone on a vacation in a while, and we were very eagerly looking forward to it. And the year before, we had been introduced to something that you can do on the ocean. I guess you could do it on a lake, but it's called paddle boarding. And it's essentially a big looking surfboard that you stand on top of. They give you a very long paddle and oar, and you stand and and you paddle. And on a calm body of water, it's I would imagine not too too terribly difficult. You still got to get your balance and make sure that you're not falling off. But uh, on the ocean, especially if it's a little bit choppy that day, uh, it can be quite exciting and, and pretty fun. And so this last year, or this uh, about a month ago, when we had the opportunity to go, uh, Tiffany was very excited to, to jump up on that board and, and to take off. And so we're getting her ready to go. We're kind of launching her out into the ocean, and then uh, I had rented a kayak as well. And so uh, I'm getting ready to to follow her. But as I look up, I kid you not, like maybe five minutes later, I look up and she's just gone. She's going from Navarre to Pensacola as fast as she possibly can. The, the current just grabbed her and it was just taking her. And the problem with that is uh, she wears glasses. And those of you who wear glasses, you realize that some of you, you, you kind of need them to maybe read. She needs them to function in life. She needs them to be able just to see. And so she thinks that, you know, I'm doing good. I'm staying up on the board and I'm having a high-ho time. And as her husband of 15, almost 15 years, I'm, I'm way back in the distance, like, S slow down. You're going, to, you're going to go to Cuba if you're not careful. Like, you're just going too fast, too far. And so I found that in no way was I going to catch her in the water. So I get that kayak up on the shore as fast as I can. And, and what I found was this. She, she didn't intend to do this, but she was literally just drifting further and further away. And she couldn't even see that that was the reality of what was going on. It took someone, me, to jump out of that kayak, 
found that I could run on the sand faster down the beach, swim out into the ocean, and, and, and lovingly yell at my wife and tell her, I need you to come to shore. We, we, we need to get you restored to some, some semblance of safety. And, and I believe the reality for, for a lot of us is that we don't even realize at times that not in a salvation sense of I, 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 I'm a Christian and I'm a believer in Christ, but I don't know about you, but this is true in my life, unfortunately at times in my life, that though I love Jesus and I know that he is my savior, there are those moments where it's as if I'm almost blind and I'm just drifting away from him and away from his presence. Even though I know that that's not what I want. Even though I know that this isn't a healthy position to be in. And a lot of times, uh, even when I first had the opportunity to come and, and be able to preach with you and, and be able to, to have that time, I was praying, Lord, what, what do you want us to look at? And I don't know about you, but there's been a lot of different things that have been presented this year uh, in sermons that have all been fine, but it's been a lot of things that are directly uh, as a result of 2020 and COVID and everything. And, and as I've been hearing a lot of different things come my way, the, the desire that I had was that those, those things that I've heard in no way have necessarily been, been bad. It was right now what I need a glimpse of is I need a glimpse of, of, of my God. In the midst of everything that's going on, I really need a glimpse of Him because that's going to really help me navigate this life and all the trials that we're facing over the course of this year. And so as the Lord brought me to Exodus, it was because what we found in Exodus is this idea of the presence of God and how desperately we need the presence of God in our life. And if you look at verse 27 in Exodus 34, Moses is writing uh, and, and he says, or God is saying this, he says, write down these words for in accordance with these words, I have made a covenant with you and with Israel. What's happened here at this point, if you haven't been with us, is that restoration has taken place. There was sin that took place in the nation of Israel where Moses is giving the Ten Commandments for the first time on Mount Sinai. And as he is up there, the people of Israel are at the base of Mount Sinai wondering where is Moses and where is God? We haven't seen him in a while. And they begin to turn their affection to worshiping a golden calf. Even though they experienced walking through the Red Sea, even though they experienced seeing God descend as a pillar of cloud um, or a cloud and a pillar of fire to, to lead them and to guide them. They've seen all of this, but a little bit of time, a little bit of distance, and, and they began to wander and their heart's affection went to worship other things. And God lets them know in Exodus 33, as a result of your sin, your sin separates you from my presence. And because I care about you, I can't go with you. Because if I go with you without a consequence of the sin, I'm actually going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to kill you. And we read that at times and we go, and God, God seems really harsh. But I read that and I say, God is very loving and sparing. That he would say, you can go to the promised land. I'm going to keep my promise. But because there is sin, I can't go with you. Because if I do, there will be consequence. And what we find is that what we've been looking at over the last several times that I've been here is just this restorative process of a holy covenant-keeping God coming to a covenant-breaking people who have no claim or right to be restored, yet God in His grace and in the intercession of Moses, these, these two groups, this covenant relationship is restored. Specifically in chapter 34, we see that it is being renewed. And we're at the very end of where God is saying, yes, I am with you. The covenant is renewed. And what I find it is it's, it's almost this idea of they get the presence of God back and it feels so good. And it reminds me of this idea of almost coming home. They're getting to come home to God. Do, do, do some of you recall, I, I remember I was thinking about this when I was in college. I loved being in college. I loved the opportunity to meet these different people, to study these different subjects. But when I had the opportunity to go home, Oh, it was, it was sweet. It was glorious. Homemade meals, 
Mom is just cooking. I could bring home a semester's worth of laundry and just throw it in there. And mom, in her gracious and kindness, would say, I'll take care of it. I was very, that, that, that was very kind of her. But it was not just the food and the smells and, and all these things. It was the people. It was familiar. And it was family. It was home. And for some of you, you, you've had those opportunities of where you've been away and you get to come home. And I would say, and, and, and in my opinion, and kind of to define that, it, 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 it's glorious. It's glorious to be able to go home and to have that sense of sweet camaraderie and just closeness. And I can't help but imagine that as we continue, look at verse 29 of Exodus 34. I just can't help but imagine that here is this sweet restoration that the nation of Israel is about to hear about. That finally I'm, we're, we're going to be back restored into the presence of God. But interestingly, these verses, verses 29 through 35, they're, they're kind of unique. You can almost have ended in verse 28 of Exodus 34 and just pick right up in Exodus 35. But for whatever reason, God includes this story. And I just want us to take a brief look at it here for just a moment. Look, look at Exodus 34, verse 29. It says, So it came about when Moses was coming down from Mount Sinai, and the two tablets of testimony were in Moses' hand as he was coming down from the mountain, that Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because of his speaking with God. Now, I don't know how to explain this. I don't understand the physiology of all of this, but somehow... The glory of God, when he, when Moses was with God on Mount Sinai, the glory of God, as we even read where Moses asked God, show me your glory. And he says, you can't see my face, you'll die, but I'll put you in the cleft of the rock and I will pass by you and then I'll remove my hand and you can see the back of me. Because if you see my face, it's just going to be too much. But here we see the, 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 the results of all of that. that. That his face is just radiating. Verse 30, so when Aaron and all the sons of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, they, they were afraid to come near him. I would imagine so. If, if, if someone came to that door and their face was just gleaming, I actually might be nervous and say we probably need to go out this, where's the exit? We need to go out that door because that would be a frightening thing to see. You haven't seen Moses in 40 days and 40 nights and then this person's coming down? I, I would imagine. I would be afraid as well. Verse 31, then Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the rulers in the congregation returned to him. Moses spoke to them. Afterward, all the sons of Israel came near, and he commanded them to do everything that the Lord had spoken to him on Mount Sinai. This is just a side note. This has nothing to do with the rest of the message today, but I think this is important. At the end of Exodus 24, I believe, Moses goes up to Mount Sinai for the first time to meet with God and receive the Ten Commandments. The last time he was gone for 40 days and 40 nights, we just went over, but what did the people of Israel do? You can actually, what did they do? They worshiped the golden calf. They couldn't wait on the Lord. This time, it's 40 days and 40 nights again that Moses is getting kind of Ten Commandments 2.0, if you will. And as he comes down, I find it encouraging because a lot of times we kind of knock on the nation of Israel like, look, they messed up again. But here's an incredible moment of they waited on the Lord. They learned from their sin. I just, I think we need to encourage that every once in a while to see that they weren't always off. Verse 33, so when Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil over his face. But whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would take off the veil until he came out. And whenever he came out and spoke to the sons of Israel what he had been commanded, the sons of Israel would see the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face shone. So Moses would replace the veil over his face until he went in to speak with him. Now again, this story, interesting, but perhaps a little bit peculiar. It's like, wow, the glory of God, Moses' face just shining, but why is it here? Well, for the rest of our time, I want you to journey with me to the book of 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 is where we'll be for the remainder of our time here this morning. Because every once in a while, we read Old Testament scripture, and we're like, oh, that's interesting. And every once in a while, we'll read Old Testament scripture, and we'll find a New Testament counterpart, and we'll go, wow, that's why that story is in the Old Testament. 
this really is in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 is God's commentary of what we just read in Exodus 34. Of the face of Moses shining, the face of Moses radiating. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, I, I want you to begin, we're going to look at verse 12. There's a lot around this that's really good, but we're going to focus in beginning, excuse me, in verse, in verse 12. It says, therefore, having such a hope, we use great boldness in our speech. And are not like Moses, who used to put a veil over his face so that the sons of Israel would not look intently at the end of what was, and if you don't mind underlining in your Bible, at the end of what was fading away. If you take notes, this will be kind of the first thing, is the first thing that I want us to see this morning is that there is a greater glory. There is a greater glory. The reality of what Moses experienced was indeed glorious. His face radiated as a result of it. But we even see in 2 Corinthians 3, the verses right before verse 11, that as glorious as that moment was, as glorious as even as the law is, there is a glory that surpasses that glory. Jesus. There is a greater glory. The sad thing is what's happening here is the Apostle Paul, who's writing this letter to the church of Corinth in 2 Corinthians, as he's writing this, he makes a point to say that what was happening is that this glory was fading away. What Moses had experienced, that glorious moment with God, was actually wearing off. And the reason why he brings that up is because I think perhaps the key word is in verse 12, hope. I wonder right now, could you use a little bit of hope in your life? Therefore, having such a hope, he's talking to the Corinthian believers in Jesus. You have a hope, and it's a hope that's even greater than what the Old Testament saints were experiencing. And specifically, even Moses, who was at like the, the top pinnacle of the Old Testament saints. You guys have, have such a hope that the veil was not, that because what would happen is when Moses would wear that veil, the reason why he would keep putting that veil on is because the glory is fading, and he didn't want the people, the nation of Israel, to see that the glory was fading, because there's almost this idea of, like, are we losing again the presence of God? So he would put that over his face to almost cover what was going away, what wasn't lasting. But that moment with God wasn't intended to last for. For forever, because it was pointing to something that was ultimately going to last forever, which is Christ, the glory of Christ. I, I, I liken it to this. Again, went to the beach. I got, I got tan. I wasn't as pasty looking anymore. And then whenever I got home, it doesn't take long for for that tan to begin to fade, even though I don't want it to. What some people will do, I. I I, 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 don't, I don't do this, but they'll get bronzer. They'll start putting some bronzer on because they don't want to lose that look. They don't want that thing that's faded away, so they put something superficial on top of it. Well, I want to ask you for just a moment. Where does your hope lie in? Are you putting something superficial into your life right now in order to almost convince yourself that you're okay? And, and it's not to say, well, but the Sunday school answer, the answer is Jesus. It's just the reality. The answer is Jesus. He is our great hope. And not a hope that we sometimes use that word of like, I wish. It's an expectant reality of, of, of just the truth of what you're experiencing. There's a hope that we have in Jesus. It's life-giving. But, unfortunately, what we see with the nation of Israel is something similar to what we even experience here, I think, today in our time. Look at verse 14. If, if number one, there's a greater glory, number two, then we need to see that glory, the glory of Christ. Number two, see the glory of Christ. Beginning in verse 14, it says, but their minds were hardened, referring to the nation of Israel in the Old Testament. For until this very day, at the reading of the Old Covenant, the same veil remains unlifted because it is removed in Christ. But to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their heart. The Jews that Paul is writing about to the church in Corinth were a group of people who were hearing the same gospel that the believers in Corinth were hearing. 
but they weren't getting it. In, in, in the same way that Moses had a veil over his face, they have a veil over their hearts and is keeping them from seeing, knowing, and experiencing the glory of God. And, and you might say, okay, well, that's interesting for them. What does that have to do for me? Well, in the same way that some people who knew all of the Old Testament but couldn't see the glory in Christ, I think the same is true for us today. And I want us just to be, to be cautious and to be aware today. That regardless of how many times you have heard the gospel of Jesus, that regardless of how many times you've darkened the door and come into a worship setting, have you placed your faith in Christ? Do you have a personal relationship with Jesus? Is He your hope? Is He your Lord? Is He your Savior? Because I don't know about you, but but I, I, I've grown up, I grew up in Oklahoma, and I've lived in this part of the world, the Bible Belt, for pretty much all of my life. And it's one of those things of where I can knock on a door, I can visit with someone, and just about everybody in the South believes themselves to be a Christian. But yet, by the fruit of their life, you, you just begin to not be judge and jury, but you begin to wonder, do you, do you know do you know Jesus? And I ask that to you this morning, not, not to cause you to doubt, but as, as we read later on in 2 Corinthians 13, that you would have a moment to test and examine your faith of, is it genuine? Is it real? Is it in the gospel of Christ? Or is it in something else? And Paul is, is just, I believe, having a, just an earnest desire to, to hope that they will get this. That, that the veil... Of, of their hearts would be lifted so that they would come to faith in Christ. And, and, and perhaps we, we, could, we could end with this last point right here, but, but, but we're not. Sometimes we have people in our life that we know have heard the gospel. They may be a friend or a family member, a co-worker. In fact, who is God bringing to your mind right now that you're just like, I, I wish that they would know Jesus? With every fiber of my being, I just I long for them to come to faith in Christ because I know that that's what that's what they must have, that's what they need. But yet, it's almost as if we go, well, they keep hearing it and they keep resisting. They keep hearing the gospel and they keep resisting. And what I want to encourage you to do this morning is that you would pray for that individual again, but that you wouldn't just pray, but that you would proclaim. The same guy who wrote Corinthians wrote the book of Romans, and in Romans chapter 10 it says, For whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I believe that. But how will they believe in whom they have not heard? And how will they hear unless someone has preached or proclaimed the gospel to them? Oftentimes what we want to do is we want to say, Man, I really hope that they'll come to faith in Jesus but you are the means by which they will hear the message of Jesus. Amen. And if that's not the business that we're in, then what as the church or a church are we doing? That we would desire that the veil would be lifted. And, and again, I understand that there may be some people in your life, you go, Stephen, their, their hearts seem so, so hard. I just want to encourage you, pray for them again. Just pray for them again. And then pray for the opportunity to proclaim to them the gospel again. You can't save them. That's God's work. But the work that he gave you and he gave me is to proclaim the gospel. Because it's only when that takes place that they have an opportunity to call upon the name of the Lord. And look at verse 16. This is the great news of this passage. But whenever a person turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. You hear that? When the, when the person turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. It's no longer uh, blinding them of, of the reality and of the truth. They begin to see the glory of Christ and experience the glory of Christ. So, number one, there's a greater glory. Number two, we see that that glory is Christ. But number three, this is a little bit more personal for, for, for you and for me. For those who believe in Jesus, you would call him Savior and Lord. Number three is that you are being transformed. You may not feel like it, but you are. You are being transformed. Look at verse 17. It says, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. 
Though we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, here it is, are being transformed into the same image. The glory of the Lord that was on the face of Moses is like our lives. That's what he's saying. And some of you might go, that's strange to me. I've, I've never had an experience like Moses where literally my, the pores of my face were radiating some kind of light. In fact, I would say most days I don't exactly feel radiant when I wake up. Maybe if I moisturize the night before, I feel a little bit radiant whenever I wake up in the morning. But generally speaking, the idea of feeling radiant is, isn't that reality. But how many, in how many, any way does this passage describe our lives? How are we, in fact, glorious or experiencing glory? And it's by being transformed into the same image. And as it says on the screen, from glory to glory. The, the ESV, the English Standard Version, I love the way that they put it as well. It says that they're being that we are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. And you go, okay, well, what does that mean? Well, we're going to unpack that here for just a moment. In order for us to be transformed, he sure talks about the Spirit quite a bit. And so if you have the Spirit that dwells uh, within you, and you ask, well, do all of us have the Spirit? If you're in Christ, you do. Romans 8 lets us know, Romans 8 9, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to God. So if you're not in Christ, you don't have the Spirit. If you don't have the Spirit, you definitely don't belong to God. And so part of your examination today is, am I in Christ? And if that's a reality, I should, I should be experiencing some kind of change or transformation in my life. I should be looking differently from, from where I was years ago to where I am now because of my faith journey in Christ and in the Spirit. There should be a difference in who we are because we are being transformed into this image, this glorious image. So the Spirit dwells within us, and when the Spirit comes to dwell within us, it's, He sets off this chain reaction which then leads us to being transformed, specifically transformed from one degree of glory to another, to that ultimate glory, heaven. Talk about home, heaven. For just a moment, I want to give you just a little bit of like a, a theology 101, maybe 103. When you come to faith in Christ, there's a moment where you've heard the gospel. It's been proclaimed to you because you can't believe until you hear the gospel. So the gospel of Christ, he died for our sins, rose three days later, defeated sin and death. And then we repent of our sins and we believe in the work of Jesus upon the cross and upon the, upon the grave. In that moment, what we are told from Scripture, in that moment, we are made right with God. And we are justified in that moment. But a lot of times, as believers in Christ, that's where we kind of sit and stay. I've been justified, which is glorious. But what we kind of look forward to is, I may get out of camera, but we get to this end point of our salvation journey, which is, at a moment in time, repented, believed in the Lord, justified. But at the end, here I am glorified. When I die because of my faith in Christ, I am going to be with him forever in eternity in heaven. But there's this in-between part that we're all in right now if you are in Christ. You were justified. You will be glorified. In between is what's called sanctification where we are working out our salvation, where we are, if you will, being transformed into the image of Christ. And what Paul is saying is that from the moment of justification where you came to faith in Christ to the moment he takes you home into heaven and everything in between is from glory to even a more ultimate glory. It is all glorious. So though I don't feel radiant at times and glorious, i got to step back and go, God is doing a transformative work in my life. It is indeed glorious. I want to experience the gloriousness of it long before I get to the ultimate glory of heaven, which we all look forward to. But right now, I can experience the presence of God in a glorious way as he's continuing to craft me, to mold me, to purify me for my good and for his glory. 
He said, okay, well, why do you bring all that up? Thank you for Theology 103. The, the reason why is that when, when we die, yes, we get to enjoy the presence of God ultimately and forever. But while you live in Christ, are you enjoying the presence of God now? Is it glorious to you to gather corporately and worship Him, to hear from Him, or after about 30 minutes, you're like, God, I, I can't take it anymore. He, he's just talking too long. I want to check out. Or taking that time in, in our daily devotion of God, I want to meet with you because you are glorious and I want to be in your presence. And not that I'm going to have some, some camp high experience, which is fine and good. I've had that. I'm not going to have this kind of really powerful, emotional worship song service, which is great and powerful. I've had that. But it's that on a day-to-day -day basis, as I am being transformed, as I am being sanctified, even in the mundane, Lord, help me to see that it's glorious. Because you're glorious. From glory to glory. But again, as I was studying this passage, I was like, okay, God, but I want a little, I want a little bit more. <laughs> Uh, I'm very selfish in that way. I'm like, but what, is the, what does that glory look like specifically other than just this kind of moment? And it's, I think we get little tinges of the glory of God. When I get to go to a plant nursery with my wife yesterday, and we pick out some hydrangeas, I'm learning, and uh, some pompous grass to put in our front yard. And to see her, I'm just like, I don't, I don't really care. But she's so happy to me. That's, 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 a, that's a glorious moment. Or maybe for you with a with with a child or a grandbaby, newborn, and you just get to hold that baby and you're just like, this is a glorious moment right now. This is glorious and miraculous. But, uh, but as we've gone through this journey in Exodus, I can't help but wonder if perhaps one of the most glorious things, if I can use that word, because I don't think it's the best, but one of the most glorious things that we can experience before we are ultimately glorified and with the Lord in heaven, is that though I as a believer in Christ know the glory of God and the beauty therein, I sadly and willfully exchange the glory of God for sin in my life. I willingly drift from Him and you say, wow, this is really glorious, Stephen. I'm getting there. Because I think to get the glory, we've got to know the bad news. And the bad news is that I think you would all agree with me. I would imagine from Scripture that though I am a child of God, though I am in Christ and I have the Spirit dwelling within me, I can still at times drift, not in a salvation sense of I'm losing my faith, but I'm drifting from the sweet fellowship of God. And that's sad. But perhaps the most glorious thing that we get to experience after that moment of justification when we repent and believe and we're in this process of being transformed, sanctified, is that though I am willingly doing so, drifting from the Lord, He still will embrace me. He will still draw me back to Himself. And some of you might be saying, this is all well and good. It does feel kind of almost like a theology thing. What's the point of this? The point of this is this. Are you drifting? Or are you far from the Lord right now in your walk as a believer in Christ? And I don't want you to give the right church or Sunday school answer. Before you and God, do you, do you feel that he is near in your life? And I, if you're like me, I know that that's what I desire. That's what I want. And yet willfully, I drift away. Sometimes even unknowingly, like Tiffany on that paddleboard. And the beauty of what we found in Exodus 34 is that by the grace of God, the intercessory work of Jesus, He can restore us and bring us back home to Himself. That's one of the most glorious things that we can experience this side of heaven. It's not just our salvation moment, 
but that when we continue to err and drift, he keeps embracing us. And, and the question that I had was like, Lord, why and how would you keep embracing me? And it's because, as we saw in Exodus 34 early on, that, if you will, in one arm, he is holy and he is just. But in the other arm, that's his character, holy, just. But in his other arm, as much of who he is, is he is merciful and he is gracious and he is forgiving. And it's with both of those arms that he embraces us so that he's not contradicting himself. He's not being a hypocritical God. He is going to deal with that sin and he's found a way to deal with it, which is the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. But he's also with his grace and his mercy and his love. He can take us and he can embrace us and say, you're restored. Come home. I want, to have, I want to invite you this morning to come home, believer. Come home into the presence of God. I don't even have my phone with me, so <laughs> I had to ask my parents last night, what was the address of the first house I grew up in? My dad's a pastor. We stayed if we lived in a parsonage. I still can't remember. It's in my text messages. I apologize. I forgot to bring that up. But the first house I do remember, growing up in, I was almost six years old, 2810 West 64th Place, Tulsa, Oklahoma, 74132. I have a thing for numbers and dates. Second place I remember living in, high school, 10703 East, 114th Street South, Bixby, Oklahoma, 74008. And when I was in college, when I would come home to 10703 East 114th Street South, that was going home. But then something weird happened. I got into grad school, seminary. I met that lovely young lady. I got married. And I started living in this other place with her. 1805 Ferguson Court South, apartment F, Fort Worth, Texas, 76115. And when I would go see my parents for the holidays, it was familiar, but home was with her. Because home is not about a place, it's about a person. And so for some of us, we might say, man, I really need to pull myself up on my bootstraps to get right with God. And that has its place. There's, there's stuff in Scripture, practical things we can put into our lives to, to prevent us from walking into sin and fleeing from temptation. That's all there. But I think sometimes it's just a sweet reminder that if you want to be restored with God, then be reminded that what you're going home to is, is not a, it's not about a place, it's about a person. Even when we ultimately look forward to that ultimate glory of, of being with the Lord in heaven, if God's not there, I won't go. It's heaven because God is there. And when we begin, I think, kind of step back from that and look at that on a large scale and see for all that it's worth, we do begin to realize that it really is not about a set of rules and regulations. It really is not about going to a certain place one day, although I look forward to heaven. It really, really is about being in a right relationship and right fellowship with Jesus. Amen. So I invite you to come home. <clears throat> If you would, I want you to bow your head, close your eyes. So right now, where's home? You may know the right answer. It's Jesus. Jesus is home. He just preached about it. But some of you, I, I believe, and this isn't casting any judgment. I think it's just reality. I believe that there are some here this morning who may be unknown to you, or you, you definitely recognize it, that you have been drifting and are drifted away from the presence of God in a way that you know is not healthy. And you have a response time right now to either stay in your willful disobedience, or maybe you're like, I do want to be restored, but I don't feel worthy. That you would recognize that it is a lie from the accuser that God's mercy triumphs over his justice. And he will mercifully welcome you with open arms. But will you go to him? 
will you repent and experience that embrace this morning? Because I think for so many of us, if everything else that's going on in this world and in our life, it feels hectic, chaotic, I think we could all just use a little bit of that embrace and just being able to go home. So I want to give you just a, a moment, and then I'm going to close this in, in prayer, and we're going to sing this final song. But I want to give you a moment, because a lot of times I don't get that on a Sunday morning. I want to give you just a moment to talk to the Lord and go home.
preacher to get this mic going here so they can hear me. Like the old TV thing, you can go ahead and hear me. TV land, not TV land anymore. I keep telling internet and streaming and everything else. So glad to have everybody here this morning. Glad to have everybody that's watching online. Uh, sure am glad that you're with us this morning. Stephen, that's a great message. Man, you almost got me shouting out there. <laughs> Y'all probably think, man, what's happened to Tim? Did he fell out of the chair or something? Uh, there's so many truths he was talking about. I know in my own life, he was talking about from justification, let me get my mic on here, from justification to glory. If we're not careful, the old country's saying, you know what a rut is? Have you ever heard I'm just in a rut. A rut ain't nothing but a grave with the ends kicked out of it. You think about it. A lot of times I catch myself in the morning. That's not what it's supposed to be, is it, brothers? It's, it's glory. It's supposed to be glory. Even the bumps and the humps and the hills and the valleys you find yourself in, God's working on you. Told me that out there. We're a work in progress. And we just got to keep hanging on in there with Jesus. And I sure appreciate that message, brother. Thank you. Uh, got some folks out traveling this morning. All the Myers clan is in Georgia. They're traveling, visiting family, so be praying for them. Kyle and Rebecca and the children are all in Florida, aren't they, Leah? Uh, be praying for them. Say travel back. When are they coming back, Leah? You don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, whenever they come, God knows. Give them a safe journey back home. Uh, you see, uh, Dave's back here by himself. Miss Shirley's home. Uh, there, uh, their dog Sasha had surgery, didn't, didn't Dave? So be praying for that family. You know, when folks got pets, they're just, that's family. So be praying that uh, Sasha's okay and taken care of. Uh, got a prayer request coming up from you guys. You know, Miss Paul? My daughter and Okay. Anybody else? Okay, I won't hold you too long. I won't. I do want you praying about something though. Uh, John talked about it. So well, he he brought this up in our and when he's closing last Sunday about that we were talking, the church was talking with Stephen and Stephen is talking with us. And this is Stephen. Some of you that I talked with last week, we've had so many guest pastors and speakers, you say, which one's Stephen? <laughs> so I want to let them know that that was Stephen. And uh, we're glad to have him. And you be praying for Stephen and praying for us as we as we talk and we seek God and see what God has for us and see the uh, we Stephen wants to be a part of us. We sure are talking that way. So be praying that I want to let you guys know. So like I said, some uh, mighty fine we have some good speakers, but we want to know specifically who has him praying for. And anybody else? Anything? Go for the Lord and word of prayer. Lord, we thank you, Lord, this morning for your touch, your revel revelation knowledge, Lord, and things of, of, of what you delivered to us. And your anointing on Stephen, Lord, uh, the word that he brought. Lord, we uh, ask you right now as we lift up the Myers, Lord, as they're traveling back or they're having fun with family, Lord, give them a safe journey back. Kyle, Rebecca, Felix and Luna, Lord, and you know, whoever else might be with them, Lord, I pray that you help them have a good time, a safe time, Lord, and a safe trip back home. Lord, I forgot to mention that Doug is also preaching in Fosterville this morning, so Lord, I pray that he had a good message, your anointing was on him, Lord, be with Doug. 
and Janice also, Lord, in her continued healing. Lord, uh, praying for Shirley and uh, Lord, that their, that their dog heal up, Lord, and Lord, you just uh, uh, touch in that situation. Lord, we uh, lift up our prayer request to you, Lord, from uh, the church family here, Lord. And if the degree is in touch, and Lord, Paul lifts up her daughter and her granddaughter. They're traveling from Pennsylvania, Lord. You give them traveling mercies. And Lord, you put your guardian holy angels around them and watch over them as they come back home. Lord, I pray that you give us, Lord, as elders, wisdom, Lord. Uh, Lord, undergird this church. And yeah, Lord, you. You tell us Lord, what to, and show us what you have us do as a body of believers. Lord, you constantly, with Stephen and us too, show us if we're going in the right direction. You do, and you direct that direction. And Lord, if we're getting too far out in deep water on a paddle boat, Lord, you uh, you get us back over. And Stephen was saying, Lord, you uh, you show us what you have us to be doing. Lord, we thank you for this time together this morning. Watch over everybody as they're going back home in the rain. Lord, I pray that uh, Hurricane Delta, Lord, uh, if it goes on and diminishes on out, Lord, if anybody sustained damage from that, Lord, you you help them and, and uh, lift up those families. Lord, we give you all praise, honor, and glory for everything that was said this morning. For it is in the blessed name of Jesus Christ we pray and believe. Amen. Yeah.